Good day and welcome to the Leading with Nice interview series podcast where we want to help you inspire others, build loyalty, and get results. My name is Matthew Ewell and as per usual, I am super excited about today's guest. I'll tell you how I came across her. I was in a local store in my community and it was a new shop and I asked the owners, I said, what should I buy? And they pointed to two products. They said, these are the two products you want to bring home. One of them was coffee and the other one was this bag of popcorn which looked delicious i actually bought three different varieties of it um and my kids promptly ate it <laughs> it was called comeback snacks and so i you know i like like you do when you learn uh, about something you like you google it and then i stumbled upon this awesome story behind this brand and emily o'brien who's my guest today is a founder and she is uh, the driving force, the uh, original uh, concept, the dream, the desire, the goal, the mission behind everything that this bag of popcorn is, uh, which is, is so amazing. So, Emily, welcome to the show. And it, and if you wouldn't mind, like, can you just tell a little bit before we get into? I have some questions for you that I really want to dive deep quickly into. Just give mm-hmm. our listeners a little bit of info of who you are <laughs> and what the brand is all about. For sure. So I started the company in 2018, and that was actually when I was in federal prison. And growing up, I never imagined myself there. You know, great family, um, honorable student, always volunteering, always had jobs, and, you know, ran into some issues with substances. And then often with issues with substances comes bad relationships. And that relationship landed me on a trip to St. Lucia, where he told me, you know, he went from being one person in Canada to someone that told me that I had to bring drugs back to Canada, like from St. Lucia to Canada. And so long, very long story short, um, I had two kilograms of narcotics strapped to my body and was sentenced to four years in prison when I got caught at Pearson airport. So, and in prison, I, I really saw, you know, how similar everyone's story really was, um, and how people just wanted to get back on their feet. Um, but they felt so lost and felt so misunderstood. Because they, that was the only bad thing they, they had done in their life. Or they just had never been supported in their life. And that was all they knew. So I wanted to help recalibrate. Um, I wanted to recalibrate my own life. But also help redefine others' lives. And instead of it just being from that one thing. Um, helping them reach their potential. Because everyone does have it. Mm. You know, um what I find, uh, just sorry, I, I had another question lined up. And then, of course, like most things, when I'm hearing your story, I'm like, oh, I want to know more about that. I love the idea what you just talked about, the recalibration. And mm-hmm. I want to get, I want to talk, I want to help people tell you. So if you're listening today, what I'm hoping you pull away from this is a paradigm shift on how we view people that have had pasts that may not look uh, like your white picket fed storybook. Um, because there's real value there. But I want to actually dig into a little bit right now on the individual who has that past and how difficult is it f- for that recalibration to happen, for them, for their paradigm shift to happen personally? In general, I mean, you know, you can't speak for everybody, but give me a sense In, of what I would you, say the first, start, the first stop, the first obstacle is getting past it internally, right? Because once you're charged with something, that's all they look at. Right. And that's kind of what they just hit you on the head with over and over again. And incarceration is not about rehabilitation. That's just like the label they put on it. Right. Um, It's just like some foods that say healthy and then you read the label. And if you didn't read the label, it wouldn't actually be healthy. So um, that's kind of what incarceration is like. And they applaud it as being a way where people go in and, and will learn. And, but that's not true because a lot of people never had the support going in and you truly need support in all kinds of ways, um, not just financially, but emotionally, mentally, physically. Um, there's so many ways that you actually need more support than just being locked in a box and then just being left to the wolves when, when you leave, right? So um, that's kind of what, what I wanted to help help redefine. And if I didn't have the support that I did, you know, I, I had a great family, but I also had to hold up my end of the bargain because I knew that my substance use and you know, substance use can come all in any range. It can be illegal or legal. Um, Overuse of anything can lead us down, (laughs) down a path where we wish we didn't go. Right. So um, Mm -hmm. 
that's what that's kind of what what led me there and if I didn't address this then I wouldn't have had that support right so I, I did not get off easy um you know I had to go through a lot of challenges within my own family and I had to, a lot of work to do but if I didn't do that and if I didn't have their support as well then my trajectory would have been very very different okay again for listeners who have not experienced this and you know I can't get over how often uh, I hear this because uh, in in our work leading with NICE, we we deal a lot with trust building. And obviously the first thing we do is build a lot of trust with our clients. And mm-hmm. I am not anymore, but I was at first surprised how many people have something in their life, either that they experience personally, a family member that has been in a situation, uh, sometimes it's criminal, sometimes it's not, that... Uh, they'd be embarrassed or shy to share. And I think the first thing, uh, just hearing what you just shared, I'd want our listeners to know, is that if you look to your left and right, uh, you're probably much closer to somebody who has a situation like this in their life. And I'm sure you've come across that as well as people learn your story. I'm sure they open up to you with their own. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And the thing is, like before I even went to prison, I had a pretty successful social media business. And there were still people that were breaking laws except just not getting caught and or having you know really powerful lawyers or the resources to hide those decisions right and often it's the people that don't have the resources to hide them mm-hmm. um are the ones that are you know getting the short end of the stick and mm-hmm. just but actually doing the exact same thing that a lot of people a lot of other people are doing hmm. you know this season on the podcast we're talking a lot about uh, overcoming adversity and so you have this like incredible true life story that you've lived um, and you, you've you gone through and you're still going through and the journey is still ongoing. Mm-hmm. Tell me about where do you find that, um, where do you find that drive to, you know, put one foot after the other, to get up every morning, to keep, to keep going forward? Where, where does that drive come from? And I'm sure it's a few um, places. It comes from the, well, it comes from the drive to, make an impact in, in other people's lives. And, you know, we've all worked jobs and, and for people where it's just, we just feel like we're not motivated because we don't feel like we're doing anything except make our, our company money. And yeah. I've learned that that's not the end all be all end all to, to happiness and actually feeling good about your life and, and where you want to go and what actually wakes you up in the morning. Maybe, maybe for some, it is like, obviously we need it to survive. And we also want to have enough of it that we can do nice things for ourselves and, and our families. But along with that comes with the ability to, or like the, yeah, the ability to help others and, and spending time helping others, um, volunteering, doing things like that. Cause when you can actually make little and small changes, that's when you actually want to keep going. Right. And when, and we also, when you're just like addicted to being curious, I guess you could say, um, mm. I've, I've always been fascinated with, with learning, whether it's like learning about insects when I was young or, or space and like joining this, plan and going to the planetarium or like learning about plants and, and traveling around the world. So I was like, use this like insatiable thirst to learn, to learn more about, about others and the changes that we need to make to truly live in a world that we, that we do want to wake up in the morning. We do feel good about what we've done, but also we know that we have done things that have maybe harmed others and, but we want to fix it. Cause that's, that's how you, that's how you live like a, a happy life and a life where you feel confident is when you know that you've, messed up and done your best to fix it and also helped try to help others at the same time. Um, you said something there about curiosity. There's a quote I love uh, by Molly Fletcher. She was a sports agent in Atlanta. She now does consulting and she says, uh, trade defensiveness for curiosity because curiosity is the essence of a hungry learner. And mm-hmm. it's just, it's such, I mean, you said it right now, it's such wise words to live by. Um, you also said something earlier, you know, uh, and you said, I don't know, some people get out of bed for different reasons. Sometimes it's for money. I would argue that money is actually never the reason they, they might think it is, but it's usually something different. But you mentioned one earlier about helping people reach their potential. Was Mm -hmm. that something you felt before you had gone to prison or is that something you developed during that time and afterwards? Um, it was something that I've always kind of done. Like even when I was young, I'd, I'd like to volunteer and learn yeah. about different cultures and organizations. And 
how they can learn from me. So just like seeing how happy, like seeing others happy made me um, like people express gratitude for like the simplest things. Right. And so mm. sometimes we live in a world where everything is just like transactional. Mm. And when you're not living life like that, when you could just do things to, to be kind, I think that's kind of how you can, like, like I said, like, that's honestly why, how I wake up in the morning. And cause you never know how you're going to do it. You never know who you're going to meet and you, you never know where, where that's going to take you. And because I've always been curious, doing all these things opens up the world even more to me. And I want, I, I'm very confident I'm going to live a very long life just because I'm very thirsty to learn and, and help and drive impact and whether it's in the form of a text message or even a, a grant or something like that. Right. So it's like these little ways of helping people and changing people's lives in the smallest of ways. And it might turn into the biggest of ways. Yeah. You know, I lo- this is actually another Emily. Listen, I'm looking forward to your book because uh, I don't know if you're book in the works right now, but definitely there, just in these last like 10 minutes, you've given like three or four chapters that I would uh, eagerly read. And one of them is, <laughs> is this, is you talked about like how when you were young, you like to volunteer and you were really active socially. And mm-hmm. so it's not like this moment, this incident changed the trajectory of your attitude and personality and who you were. You made a mistake, but you were always like a, a good person. But this moment mm-hmm. where you made a mistake um, is now people look for like, Oh, what did, what did you learn? Like, how did you change? Or like, no, I actually had this as a core as a message that I think, um, again, that I hope listeners are hearing as well is that it's not like, you know, you were, um, you had to come to Jesus moment where you're like, <laughs> Oh, I need to change the totality of who I am. Like, no, I just need to reconcile with this action. I took own it, which yeah. you totally do. Your, your story is on your, if, if you want to read the whole story, it's on, I'm sure it's on your website, but I'll, there's, if you Google Emily O'Brien, come back snacks, you're going to see tons of news articles. You can read the whole story. There's great articles out there. Um, you'll re- get all the details, but you'll learn. And I want to you, Emily, as an example, uh, to people in your life that have, that have this piece of their story. Um, it often wasn't necessarily the, the entire pivot of their personality and wholeness. So, but I want to, okay, we can go on and on about that. But I, I think this thing that's really interesting people would want to know about is you know, it's hard enough like running a business in my basement um, mm-hmm. when I can go out and about. How do you start a business when you're in prison? That sounds immensely complicated. Well, that's exactly why. It just sounds immensely complicated. Because oh. <laughs> that's what we're, we've been taught, right? We, we've been taught and, you know, surrounded with marketing messages all the time that we need all these fancy bells and whistles and you know, the the ability to acquire so many things to build something that matters. But uh, that's when you strip away everything, like every big business, you also get down to like a, a root core and a root cause. And that for me came with lived experience, right? So I, I had everything that I needed in there. I had my experience, I had the experience of others and I had very, very simple ingredients that I could create something with. And I also had a system that needed significant overhaul or at least certain parts of it, right? So that was another driving factor. Tell, tell us about that. What do you mean? Well, the how it's not conducive to recovery or rehabilitation or people actually leaving the system. It's actually what I call a criminal reinforcement system because most people, a lot of people in there, uh, when even when you get out on parole, the conditions are so crazy and so just, how do you, what did I say? Like, just ridiculous some of these conditions like the, the rules that you can break like I, I got in trouble once because I didn't call from a landline like a landline before six o'clock at night mm. <laughs> well I was out doing speaking engagements and this was like while I was like living in a half house. <laughs> so yeah. it's like the, the, the rules that you can possibly break are just sometimes they, they just make you they line you up to fail I wouldn't and even so, know where to find it. I'd have to go to my mom's house to get a landline now I would even know yeah. where I'd get one of those the bank or the library or Starbucks or, Star- <laughs> or like a bis- like small businesses. I'll have a uh, grande frappuccino. And also, can I borrow your landline to check into my parole officer? Like, you know, yeah. right. Like, and also I'm sorry, like, that was the actual real moment for me. So, <laughs> <laughs> and nothing, I mean, I know you build up a strength uh, as you, as you know, there's this great analogy a story that uh, Stephen Covey tells in the seven habits of highly successful people. He talks about working with a, um, 
a friend of his who was a bodybuilder and long story short said, you know, the, the real muscle building only happens on the last few lifts because that's where the muscles fibers, you know, break down and then rebuild stronger. So, mm-hmm. uh, as you're going through pain, um, in any part of your life, you know, you, you can rebuild stronger, but, um, it's those moments where you're forced into like confess to a stranger why you need to do something. You're like, Oh, thanks. Thanks system for like, just kind of beating. Oh, anyhow, that's more of a reflection. Yeah. I don't have a question. I don't have a question. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So talk about, um, can you just give us a brief overview what it looked like to start this while you're in prison? Like, what were you doing? Who were you working with? Like, what was the actual business at that point? Because obviously it's grown since then. We were talking before we started. Yeah, recording. yeah. I, can't, I couldn't actually, like, I wasn't about to sell it in there, you know? Like, but I was a, I was building the brand. And that was through storytelling and things that were going on. So I would, I wrote a lot in there. Uh, I wrote articles and I also wrote about other people's stories. And I kind of harnessed all the things that were misunderstood by the public, you know? about others in there, um, whether it's about their capacity to be strong or their capacity to know how money works or their capacity mm-hmm. to build something or be crafty or be creative or to love or be kind. Mm-hmm. And I kind of focus on all those things and it wasn't very hard, you know, cause when you're in there, like I, it, that's where you see the human in everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did that. I documented everything. And then from a, like a popcorn, the food perspective, we actually lived in houses like where I was, um, you know, they were locked at night. You had your own room when you're locked in there at night, but you cooked all, all of your own food. And so we had access to like a very small grocery list so we could get certain spices on there. And then we also had access to like a canteen list where you could buy your own stuff. And, um, so I bought popcorn kernels off there and just would experiment with different like spices. And one time I put craft dinner powder on, on my popcorn and it was like, no, so that, that's actually going to be our next flavor. It's called uh, triple cheddar, but in there I called it jailhouse cheese. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like all the all the each flavor has a story, and as like how it was created, why it was created, and the meaning um, behind it. Right. So that's how I did it. And then in as soon as I was like able to leave, um, I started just like volunteering to share my story at schools, um, and like making little samples for events, and then got into commercial kitchen, got the proper licensing and then was able to actually start selling it to retailers. Mm-hmm. And then um, just went from there and then moved into a grocery store kitchen and then we got more poppers and then eventually we got a partnership with a manufacturer. So that was the very big stage. And now we just have a partnership with our second manufacturer for our <laughs> second line. So this is all since been since about two and a half years. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, people listening like, oh, all this seemed to fall into place. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of like in between between. We got a manufacturer. We got this. Like there's a lot of in between moments, mm-hmm. I'm sure. Um, yeah. So as you're, okay, you talked about, I want to I want to bring it back uh, again. We need, we need an Emily O'Brien authored book because there's way mm-hmm. too much that anyone, any one article I've read, any one podcast I listen to with, with you in it, there's like you could have. 15 more conversations about your learning and takeaways because there's a lot of great learning. Um, Mm -hmm. What uh, you had a successful social media career before going to prison and you talked about um, telling stories. How did your time in prison impact the way you view uh, social media or did it at all? Um, I wasn't like at first I saw it as an inconvenience that I had to go in, but then I knew that, also, like, I needed to, like, actually get away from alcohol entirely to to ditch it. Like, I didn't need 30 days. Like, I, th- I, like, I realized that I needed probably, like, six months or whatever it was just to, like, a full cut it off. Like, I was never physically addicted. So, like, there was no withdrawal or any of that stuff. But, um, yeah, I just think, like, when I went in, I was just ready to just be away. Um, so, but I had to develop that mindset earlier, right? Like I had to like knew, know that it was going to be good for me. And, and that I, I've, I've always like believed in myself. I might've been mad at myself during times and disgusted with myself, but I always knew that I could like come back from it because I've always been feisty. And so sometimes you can be feisty and defend yourself when you're wrong, or sometimes you can be feisty and defend yourself when you're right. And I knew that I was, knew that I was right about who I was. And, mm. but I also knew that I, again, I had to go back and, 
and address things that, that did impact my life and my family's life during that time. So social media, I was like, whatever. I didn't, get, I didn't care. I was but excited. What I'm curious <laughs> about is, um, you know, there's been a lot of reporting recently uh, about studies by, from Facebook and Instagram that shows social media um, lends itself to young people, especially having bad opinions of themselves of this uh, because of what we see. And it's, you know, relatively, uh, you know, it's people showing what they want to show of their best life. Mm -hmm. Did that give you, did that having worked in social media and um, you know, being a part of that system and and we are as well too, that you social media today um, seeing uh, being in, in, in prison and hearing the stories of the other women in there, did it give you any perspective uh, and it may not have, I'm totally going mm -hmm. off. And if this, if not, then we'll just cut this part of the podcast, but, um, oh, okay. did, did that give you any perspective at all or no, did it, no, did I, it not really I, pack factor in? Honestly, like I didn't get my first phone until I was like 15 or 16 and I still read magazines and it's like, so if you're going to put a phone in a child's hand and then blame the phone or what's on it, it's, I think it's, you could blame a number of different things. Like, <laughs> right. Awesome. Like there's it. always still print magazines that talk about this, this and that. And, so if you don't want your kid on social media, don't give them a phone at 10 or 11, because <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's great. Okay, cool. I, I, I know great. it's more complicated than that, but I, no, no, I love it. Know. Okay. So I want people to, um, I want you to speak to like HR directors, managers, uh, mm -hmm. board of governors, policy makers, mm -hmm. and help them truly understand what it's like for somebody with a criminal record. Um, that uh is trying to make their way through society what is it actually like for them like the barrier is the, the difficulties give them paint a picture sure for them. sure uh, i can say like as in someone coming out and trying to build a business i dealt with business insurance um being charged to oprah for that um you want to have a good credit check often you've been in prison you can't work so you'd have no credit you can't rent an apartment no one's gonna it's hard to get an apartment with like you know what i mean there's like it's so, there's so much competition as well. I mean, you often have, have gaps in your resume and people look at those gaps and like, oh, like, you know, most organizations aren't curious about that. They're suspicious of it. Mm. Um, so, but I also think like, if you look at so many people on LinkedIn and like, they're embellishing their resumes to shit, like, you know what I mean? Half of them are like lying about like what they do. So like, if we could actually encourage people to be honest about what happened in their lives, mm. that's what you want. You don't want like someone with this flashy resume that looks great. Cause often they're the ones that are going to disappoint you the most. Mm. So if you can like what I teach people is to talk about like your resume of failure and what you learn from it instead of like some hoity toity, like, I don't know, just thing that you have to get your friends to be at references for, you know what I mean? And it's like, you don't have to be a reference for yourself. You can just talk about it. And if you can actually be honest about that and how you learned, you, that's when you learn the most and honesty and the ability to learn and move forward from that are like two things that you want in an employee and that can also encourage loyalty and it can make them feel like family. And that's what like my organization is. And that's why we've had the same staff. They, you know, they don't take advantage of us. They, they come to us when they need something and we have a great relationship. So there's no hierarchy, right? Because we've all been there. It's just like, mm -hmm. sometimes when we get people at the top, you know, they act like they haven't ever done anything wrong and that's not true. No. So I, I love, think, um, yeah, again, coming out of prison, is, sorry, just to, sorry, just to like keep going with that yeah. coming out of prison. Um, and you see, you think someone has no skills, but that's also not true. Um, you know, people are often in, in prison because of crimes that they did that were illegal, but doesn't mean they didn't require any skill. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, and a lot of people are, are coming out and they have their, their mothers. And so, you know, they've tried to be, parents and they want to get back access to their kids or like you know they've been even like drug dealers they've some of them have ran very complex organizations uh yes. <laughs> right so it just depends on like what you're selling um i first of all this resume of failure idea i oh man that i'm not sure if that's the title of your book or just a chapter um <laughs> but i love that concept and i i'm you know what another time um, yeah, you know, there's training to be developed there for HR directors, uh, at HR and hiring managers. How do we, how do you have a part of the interview process where that conversations ha happens very safely? 
Um, so that's something I, I yeah, I'm going to think about that for a while longer. Yeah. Also, and even just like, like about substance, substance abuse and, and, and everything like that and using, it's like, why are we making our employees scared of that? You know what I mean? Like at ours, we, I like, I, I find them places to host their AA meetings. Like they have them in our office. So it's like, <laughs> why are you pretending like this is something that doesn't exist? Right. right. So it's all part Do of you mental find health. Because of the adversity you faced and like that, you, that, certain setbacks that other people would find really hard you're like it rolls off your back much easier yeah but i also don't complain about things like that because that's another way of just like blaming someone else right and the second you want to blame someone else like you are 100 percent in control or sometimes not in control of your own life but you still don't have to own it (laughs) even if you lose Mm. control so Mm. Mm. yeah i often talk with uh my wife um if it's been a slower month for our business, I'm like, I'm actually in charge of how much business we get. I'll just, I need to make more phone calls, right? It's on me. Mm-hmm. It's not, you mm-hmm. know, it's not the marketing yeah. or all that. What well, is a marketing? It's my marketing. Um, okay. So we've talked now about uh, some of the, so we've talked now about some of the hardships people face. What I'd love to get from you now is you clearly have a system that works. So can you share, um, like your hiring, your, just like give people that, that have never considered somebody, um, with their criminal record as a viable employee for their business. Can you share with them what it looks like? How, I don't know. How do you find the right person? Um, you have to, honestly, we, we seek out people, right? Like we say, um, like we have partnerships with, with organizations that are working with people that are coming out of incarceration and they kind of know the behaviors of them. Cause not everyone is ready for a job right, right yes. off the bat. There's still sure. a lot of unhealed trauma. Um, maybe they're living in a halfway house or, or a city like that, like their family is so far away. Mm-hmm. Right. So getting a full-time job is not necessarily going to pre- be a priority. Um, so you have to make sure that your candidate is someone, you know, that maybe is ready for the workforce. And so you have to talk to the people at the organizations which is great and just make sure that everyone's really transparent and that nothing that they say should basically like you can't make them feel afraid right Mm -hmm. um obviously depending on the sector there are certain sectors that yes certain crimes just it's not gonna not gonna happen but you're gonna find big organizations jp morgan now in the u.s is hires people that have been incarcerated richard branson his whole like um Virgin Trains has a whole section that they go in act and actively train people in prisons and they have programs that people can message them or contact them on the way out. So it's taking a more active approach. And and then when you become a resource like that, that's when people will, will come to you for sure. And as long as you lay all get them to lay all their cards on the table and encourage them to do that, and that's where you're gonna, you're gonna have a really transparent and open relationship that'll bring more loyalty uh, from from both ends. Yeah. Oh my gosh. There's so much to unpack in this. Um, one, we're coming up in a half an hour, which I, I want to honor yeah. your time. Um, <laughs> before we close off, um, what three steps or a few steps people can do f- first, where can they find out more about you and your product? Where can they find sure. out? To, like, aside from all the great learning we've had, the popcorn's amazing. So you need to go buy some right now. Uh, where can they find out where to pick up your product or where can they buy it? Sure. If you go to comebacksnacks.com, there's a link at the top that says locations and all the locations are there. And you can also buy directly through our website and our social media is at Comeback Snacks. And if, if there's a, if um, there's a leader or a business manager or a director, a CEO, a president that's been listening is like, okay, I feel like very connected to what Emily has been sharing today. What's, what's one thought you want to leave with, leave them with? to help maybe help them help them get on their journey of, of reflection and uh, paradigm shifting. I would say that try to imagine the person that has been through something that is someone that you're, and is someone that's trying to either get a job with you or work with you. Imagine that person was someone that was in your immediate family. And so what I call this is like proximity forgiveness. So if it's someone that you know, and you've always known, you already know their backstory. So you're more willing to trust them. So you have to be willing to learn more about that person instead of just cutting them off immediately. That way you can actually have, you know, active forgiveness and that you're 
being active in your pursuit of getting to know more about them and their actual history, as opposed to what we call as their history, because it's not their history. It was just one part of their life. Emily, so good. So amazing. Oh, yeah. I'm glad I have it. I have a pretty light day today. I'm very fortunate for that because I want to I want to reflect on what you've shared. Listen, um, oh. a few thank yous. Thank you so much to you for coming on. Um, uh, Naomi Grossman helped book this. Austin Pomeroy is our audio editor. Amber Hopkins and Carrie Cotton take care of the business while I'm here yammering away. You hear notifications going off. That's them doing work. Um, uh, there's more I know I need to thank. And Jeff Anhorn does a video for this. Jamie Hunter takes care of all our social media. So if you've seen this online, you can thank him. Emily, thanks so much. For more on this, we'll have an article and resources and links in the show notes and at leadingwithnice.com. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.